When you come to visit Earthsong, there is just a sense of space and gardens. It's like living in a big garden. We're New Zealand's first co-housing project. And what that means is that um, the village has been designed by the people that wanted to live here at the time. And we run it cooperatively and um, we do all of our decision making with consensus decision making. We're in the middle of the suburbs and we don't have a lot of green space actually around us. We try and grow as much of our own food as we can, but with four acres and 60 people on site, we don't have big enough gardens to be fully sustainable. One of the reasons this piece of land was bought by the um, group was it's on a train line. It's, we're two minutes from the train. And that means that um, it's much easier to use public transport to get in and out of town. People remark about how peaceful it is here. You know, it is, it's lovely, because there is so much more space without cars. Yeah. You really notice it. So if you come to Earthsong, the first thing you do is drive up our driveway and you park your car on the edge of the, of the four acres that the village sits on. The cars are kept separate for a number of reasons. One is so that we don't have to have um, car fumes right next to us. Um, secondly, so that when you walk into your house, you meet your neighbours. So we, yeah, and we do a lot of carpooling. If you're going anywhere, you always put out an email saying, anybody want to go to such and such and would like to share transport? So we, um, we do a lot of that. The buildings are built to last 500 years, at least. And um, there was a lot of thought gone into the design and a great deal of research into what materials should be used. Part of each building is rammed earth. The walls are really thick and um, they act as very good insulation. Rammed earth walls are very soundproof and we don't have a problem with noise at all. The rest of the house is um, a concrete base and the concrete acts as a reservoir for the passive solar design that um, runs through the whole village. And the wood has been selected because it is sustainably milled. So it's macrocarpa, and in my house it's um, Lawsonian cypress. It's all heart timber. None of the timber is treated because we're on a concrete base. The inside of the house is oiled. It's oiled with tongue oil, which um, helps preserve the wood. The outside of the house is oiled with CD50, which has got a little bit of copper in it, which also helps to preserve the wood. It does mean you have to oil the outside of your house every two years, but uh, it's a small thing to pay for a beautiful wooden house. The roofing is zinc alum, and that was selected because it has less um, environmental impact. We changed our minds and the last uh, of the buildings have got long run iron because some research showed up that zinc was leaking into the um, soil with zinc alum. They're quite well insulated. We looked at double glazing but it actually proved to be too um, expensive to put in for what we get from it because we are in Auckland, we're, not, it's, we're in South Island, it would look differently. Um, but they, um, we have insulation in our ceilings. The kitchen is a pretty standard kitchen really. It's got an electric oven and a gas hob, um, which was decided on because of energy efficiency more than anything else. Yeah, we opted for a dishwasher because the consumer were, reports on it were quite favourable in terms of provided you fill it right up it doesn't overuse too much water and also we're using water that's out of the tank so in that it's plumbed into the tank so and it's just a, a half dishwasher so yeah it's just a small one because there's only two of us live here okay. so i'm one of the people at earth song who works at home so our third bedroom and our three bedroom house was turned into an office it's been jibbed um because the research showed that jib's actually quite ecologically friendly, it's good 
insulation material and that it's and it's got finishing material and because it's made from cardboard and lime it can be used all the scraps could be used in the garden so we composted all the scraps from the um, jib that was used on site we have we people ask us do you have TV because they seem to think we're not normal but um, we do have TV and we've got one um, TV aerial for our whole block of of three houses so every that's what most people have done for a whole block of houses they'll put in one TV aerial um, one of the things you need to do when you live close with people is have have some agreements on um, how you do that so how can you have privacy and still live close together so we have some things that we've kind of agreed on you get to know people anyway and you get to read their mood and you think oh I won't talk to to Jimmy today because he's looking like he's in a hurry so people read you anyway but one we have some kind of agreements whereby if you're on the um, the side of your house that doesn't have a path then you're deemed to be in your private space so your neighbors won't call to you over the bushes to talk to you they'll just leave you be if they want to come and talk to you they'll come around to your front door and knock on your front door but people forget that you know your neighbors really well so um, it's quite different to live close by somebody you know really well than it is to live close by somebody who's a stranger. Um, in fact, it's really comforting to have your neighbours close when you know who they are and you can chat with them and borrow a, enough milk for your cup of tea or whatever. Yeah. Because we have a lot of common space, if you actually just want to want to chat with someone, you just go and sit in one of the common spaces and somebody will come up and join you. You can wind up with quite a little party there after a little while. This is another way of living in a supportive neighbourhood where you have your own space, you own your own home, and you own some things in common. So we um, have a unit title ownership of our house, and we have common land and a big common house that is owned by all of us. It's an important underpinning for Earthsong because social sustainability is a very, very important part, I believe, of sustainable living. It's one thing to put solar hot water heating in and to grow your own vegetables, but it's quite another thing to work out how to live in an urban environment with a lot of people living close to each other. We're 60 people. The age range goes from two months old to 71. We have a number of different nationalities live here. 11 different cultures as one group of people living together means we have to really think about what we're doing. We have to be conscious of what we're doing. And we have to do things that are culturally safe for people. Because the other thing too is that at Earthsong we have a number of different people from different in income brackets. So when we're thinking about what we do with our common areas, we have to take that into account. And um, if we're asking people for money, some people don't have any. So we have to be really careful about how we manage things. That's why those two things of environment and, and, and community, they, the two threads that really intertwine. So this is an organic garden. Um, it's fed on bokashi from inside and it's got lots of weeds because I've um, I'm not that great at making hot compost, but um, it's fed on bokashi and worm stuff and and comfrey tea, and not a chemical in sight. This is our natural snail control. We were totally infested with snails, this property. We were terrible, until the ducks moved in. <laughs> They did, however, develop a liking for strawberries and tomatoes, I'm afraid. This plum tree is completely loaded this year. We've had so much fruit coming on the trees, it's great. We have common gardens that are gardened by everyone. We have working bees every couple of weeks and um, there'll be a focus on one part of the gardens that we all go and work on. It's much more fun to work together in a garden than it is by yourself. 
and we get a lot done in a working bee and we enjoy them and somebody always makes a delicious morning tea. So this was um, potatoes and kumara and peas and corn that will be used in common meals. A um, group of us got together and planted it up. The potatoes have all got bokashi under them and they've completely taken off, it's been great. We have 32 households and we put as much stormwater off of this piece of land as used to come off of it when there was one house on it. So what happens to the water that comes off the site is that it gets collected in swales alongside our pathways and the swales have got um, water loving plants growing in them and what happens is the stormwater gets slowed right down so it can be reabsorbed by the plants and absorbed into the soil. This is another shot of a swale but um, it's had watercress in it and the watercress has to be pruned right back so it'll take off again. We eat the watercress in our salads but um, you have to pull it all out. So you can see how much water there is in a swale um, at this end of the property. This is where the runoff goes into the pond from here, from the swales. We have had the water right up to the concrete, but we've never had a flood. We got a grant from Watercare to actually plant up our swales. And so the buying for the swale, plants in the swales, were, was all done at once. We have solar hot water, and um, that also is a dual system. So all through summer, my hot water runs off of the sun, most of winter it does too, but if we get dark cloudy days, which happens in West Auckland, then I can switch it on to um, electric supply. So I get a two hours worth of boost to my hot water within a 24 hour period. The, the hot water boost for each household is staggered so that we don't over, over um, do our energy supply and blow the fuses. Um, our electricity, we're on mains electricity, though we are wired up to put in voltovoltaic um, if we want to, and that may be something that we do later on. And our power consumption is quite low. Firstly, the houses are really warm, so we don't have to use much in the way of heating. We use electric um, heaters, mostly, or gas heaters. Um, and secondly, we only have one line coming into the um, village, so we only pay one, one line fee. And it's much lower, it's about a quarter of what most people out there in the community would pay. Yeah, this is our communal laundry. It's um, probably the most used room in the whole place. We have four washing machines for um, 60 people, it seems to be enough, though we do chew through the washing machines, I have to say. <laughs> they get heavy duty use. And um, the idea is that doing your laundry is a chance to meet up with your neighbours, so that's why we have a communal laundry. Yeah, these are the communal washing lines, and um, we had a bit of a debate about whether to put a roof on it or not, so one's got a roof on to see how it goes. A perspex roof. It's quite good because um, you can leave your washing out here. It's quite a long way to hear from your house sometimes. So you don't have to rush out if it's raining. And you know, we live in West Auckland. It is the um, water catchment area for Auckland City, so we do get quite a lot of rain. Well, we don't have dryers. Nobody has a dryer, so you have to find some way of drying your washing. We ran into a problem with wanting to collect our own water and use it as our sole source of water supply. So we came up with a hybrid kind of idea that we collect water off of our roofs, it goes into a tank, we share one tank for say half a dozen houses, and that water feeds our garden water and our hot water in our houses. When we switch to our cold water taps, that comes from the um, ordinary water supply for the city and we're metered for that. So um, we had to come up with a compromise because we weren't allowed to just drink our tank water. Public health issue. 
you can do it if you're just a single household, but of course we're not. We're um, 32 households. For wastes, we have a bucket that collects the stuff for the worm farm. And so we feed worms, which live outside the back garden. And we use Bokashi buckets, a Bokashi system, which is an anaerobic composting system, which um, it takes anything, the Bokashi system, well, except dairy. It's very good. Um, you buy these bags of bran, which have got um, microorganisms in them and sprinkle it through the wastes as you put it in the bucket. Then you put it somewhere dark for two weeks and then you bury it. And two weeks later, if you dig in that same area where you've buried the bokashi, it will have disappeared. It rots real quickly. So it's a very good system to use if you are living in apartments and don't, you can't run a worm farm or something, but you've got access to a piece of land where you can bury things because it's very good for the soil. It grows great plants. And it doesn't smell... It smells like pickle. So it smells a bit like bread and butter pickles. So it doesn't stink, no. It's quite pleasant to use. So compost bakashi and worm farms are helping to build our soil up so that it improves. We ran into difficulties too around our sewerage. We actually have done some future proofing when we built the village, so there is allowance for us to install our own sewerage treatment. However, it was too difficult to get it through the council at the time, so we are on ordinary sewerage treatment. This is our composting toilet. We got um, a grant from Watercare to put in an experimental composting toilet because we're within city limits, that's not usual. In fact, it's not particularly allowed, but um, this is an experiment. See how it goes. So. Um, the the um, sawdust that goes into the composting toilet comes out of our own workshop, so it's another one of those cycles that we've closed. Yeah. We had a grand opening in which we had a visiting dignitary, his name was Lord Muck, and he read toilet poems <laughs> at the grand opening. And we drank pineapple juice and ate chocolate cookies. 